The grace and love of our Lord and Savior be with us always. Amen. The Word of God we want to consider today is the beginning of our Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after Pentecost for this past Sunday. From Exodus chapter 19, we're looking right now at verses 2 to 4. After the Israelites set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. My dear friends in Christ, at the time of our text, we could say that the Israelites were at the beginnings, we could say, of a new stage in their existence. In a, sen in a sense, what you could say is that God was more directly involved in the course of their lives. And, and I say that a little bit reluctantly because, well, we really should say that God is directly involved in our lives too. Maybe not exactly the same way, but in our lives, what God is doing is God is making all things in our lives work together for our eternal good. And now, if you think about it, that sounds like some pretty direct involvement to me. But the difference was in the way that he communicated with the people. And now, with the calling of Moses, what happened is that the Lord was more directly speaking to his people. And, well, if you go back to the beginning of time, what God did is God spoke directly to Adam and to Eve and, and to the early believers before the time of the flood. He talked directly to Noah as well. And, and then later on, he talked to Abraham when he called him to be the father of God's chosen people. He talked to other early patriarchs, but then there was this period of silence, we could maybe say, during those years when the Israelites were down in Egypt. Period of silence for the, well, 430 years they were there. How much of that time was the time of silence? How much of that time was the time of slavery there? We don't know the exact answers, but it wasn't then until Moses that then things changed again and the Lord did directly speak to his people again. And now in, in our lives, well, God could talk directly to us, but the, the main way in which he talks to us is through the scriptures. Now those Old Testament believers, even during the time of silence, they really had all they needed because they had the promises of God. And we today have everything that we need because we have the promises of God. We have the word of God. We don't need God to directly speak to us. But, but in the early church there with those early believers, well, with Moses, the Israelites, there was that direct communication with the people. The Lord communicated a lot with Moses and his people. He did so much for them, and, and because of that, well, the Israelites had to be moved to say, the Lord is guiding and protecting us. That was something that should have been clear to them. And, and actually, if you think about it, isn't it clear to us too? The Lord is guiding and protecting us and, and how thankful we have to be that he's doing that because if he wasn't doing that, well, we would be in trouble. But it's true. For the Israelites, for us, the Lord is guiding and protecting us. Our reading says, after they set out from Rephidim, 
they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped in the desert in front of the mountain. The exact locations of Rephidim and Mount Sinai, we don't know that for sure. There are guesses that are made. But Rephidim, that's actually a place where the Israelites stopped after they left Egypt, after they had crossed the Red Sea. It's a place where they had no water, and what God did is God gave them water from a rock. Well, from there they went on to Mount Sinai. And our reading says, Then Moses went up to the Lord. And that might be a phrase that we could almost just kind of skip over, jump over. But it's so significant. Later on, God did say to Moses, No one may see me and live. Moses, at this point in time, when it says then Moses went up to the Lord, up to God, it doesn't mean that he saw him. He was in the Lord's presence. He couldn't have seen God directly because, well, as a sinful human being, he couldn't have survived that. But, but here this tells you about the grace of God, that he allowed Moses into his presence in this special way. And what an awesome and an intimidating experience that had to be for him. Our reading says, And the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Oh, it wasn't that long before this that God had sent Moses to the people to say, I'm going to free you from slavery in Egypt, and it'd be interesting to count how many times it talks about the Israelites grumbling and complaining from the time Moses first came to them until this point in time. And actually, well, grumbling and complaining, that's something that we're so tempted to do, but, but the wonderful thing for us to recognize, of course, we'll want to try to not be grumbling and complaining, but isn't it amazing that they grumbled and complained and the Lord still wanted to talk to the Israelites? And we may grumble and complain and the Lord still wants to talk to us. He still wants us to have his grace and love. Well, the Lord says, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Through the ten plagues and the dividing of the Red Sea, what God basically did through all of that is he pretty much destroyed Egypt. He destroyed Israel's enemy. And ultimately, our Egypt, we'd have to say, that's Satan and sin. And when we think about what Jesus did at the cross, what he did to Satan and sin at the cross, well, it's not just basically defeating Satan and sin, like God basically defeated the Egyptians. That was a total defeat of Satan and sin, completely winning the victory for us. Oh, when a mother eagle wants to teach her babies to fly, what she will do is she will fly high in the sky and carry her babies up into the sky. And then when they're way up there, what she'll do is she'll drop those babies and give them the opportunity to learn how to flap their wings and to fly. And if they can't or if they won't fly, if they don't fly, what happens is she'll come swooping underneath them and catch them on her wings and carry them down to safety. And now see, that's how God took care of Israel. He wanted them to be able to fly and to live as his believing children, but when they would have their problems and struggles, when they would be inclined to fall, well, then on his eagle wings, he would grab them to protect them and keep them in his care. 
And what he did for Israel, that's what he also wants to do for us. Give us, well, help us to fly. But then also, when we would struggle, he wants to be there with his eagle wings to lift us up and to keep us safe and secure. Well, when we look at Israelite history, it really is pretty obvious, clear to us that the Lord was guiding and protecting them. And what happened to them in their existence is that they got into trouble. They had all kinds of grief when they didn't follow his guidance, when they didn't trust in him to protect them, when they thought that they could handle things on their own. And really, there's a very important and a very basic lesson for us to learn here. The Lord, as our God, he is guiding and protecting us. But when we don't follow his guidance, when we think we can handle things on our own, when we think we don't really need his protection, then we're going to be in a dangerous spot. Then we're going to be kind of where the Apostle Peter was after Jesus told him that he was going to deny him three times. Well, Peter thought he didn't, he could handle things, and he fell hard. He fell hard. That's why Jesus said to Peter and the other disciples, and to us as well, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. I am the way and the truth and the life. With the Lord's help and protection, with his guidance, we have nothing to really worry about. Well, sure, there will be bumps, and sometimes those bumps will be severe and extreme along the way. But when we seem to be falling, well, then we have our Lord with his eagle's wings ready to catch us, keep us safe, and secure. He'll keep us in his believing family, and when it's our time, what he'll do is he'll take us home safely to himself in heaven. The Lord, he is guiding and protecting us. So let's pray to our Lord. Help us always to follow your guidance and to trust in your protecting care. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we are always so tempted to want to trust in ourselves, to think we can handle things in our lives, and to want to go our own way in life. Help us to see that we can't handle things on our own, but that you will always take care of us. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for us is proof of your wonderful care. So Lord, please keep on guiding and protecting us. Give us always your help and strength so that we can endure and ultimately overcome life's problems and troubles. And then, of course, take us one day to be with you forever in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.